you know, there's a lot of hate going around in the ski industry right now. Some of this material is just too good for me not to make another one of these. So with that, welcome to Volume 2 of A Hater's Guide to Colorado Ski Resorts. In the first installment of this video, we went in alphabetical order. So, in order to share the love of my amazing idiot audience clicking away not even a third of the way through the video, we'll go in reverse alphabetical today, starting with Wolf Creek. Now, there's certainly something to be said about maintaining independence from big, scary corporate America, but if you're going to try to run an independent ski area, the experience better be pretty good. So how about instead of wasting money building a useless beginner quad, you invest on hiring more staff? Or even caring about your staff in the first place? It seriously sounds like I'm describing their resorts right now, and that's not exactly a comparison I would want if I were an independent ski area. Even if you're not going to focus on your people, then at least do something about your infrastructure. Instead of building a 9-figure tram or whatever other crap is in your master plan, why don't you make it so that your parking and base area can handle more than 100 people on a good day? Winter Park Last episode of Hater's Guide, I was looking at your old master plan. Well, good thing you came out with a new master plan for me to politely critique for Volume 2. You see, every ski area has its choke points. Winter Park has one of the worst choke points I've ever seen down at the bottom of Olympia Express. So surely in your master plan, you're replacing Olympia, supplementing it, or both, right? Well, let's take a look. What is this? What is this? What absolute freaking genius decided it'd be a real smart idea to spend tens of millions of dollars to build a fancy newfangled gondola from the town instead of working on the choke point? Heck, this new gondola is going to make the choke point worse. You know, I really love Winter Park. It's literally how my channel got started. But for the love of anything, whoever's running Winter Park needs to talk to their Altera higher-ups and get included in blackout dates. Never had I ever seen Pioneer Express with 30-minute lines in over a decade's experience skiing Winter Park until the holiday weekends this past season. That's right. The amount of time that it takes for you to watch this video is the amount of time that we spent waiting in line for Pioneer. I don't know whether Altera or the city of Denver is responsible for future projects, but to whomever it may concern, there's something you ought to know about Winter Park when it's busy. The Olympia Express gets so backed up that people are willing to push and skate along hundreds of meters of catwalk and then wait in half-hour lines for Pioneer in order to not wait in Olympia's lines. So I once again state my case. Olympia either needs to be upgraded or supplemented, and it needs to be done urgently. Veil. Oh boy. See, when everybody thinks of Veil nowadays, they don't think of Veil Mountain. They think of corporate, Veil Resorts, for all of the news articles of their absolute incompetency throughout this past season. But for as terrible as Veil Resorts is, Veil Mountain itself is honestly not that bad. There's still plenty of things to pick on, however, like, uh, this. Or this. But I mean, in all seriousness, Vail Mountain's not that bad. It's like no place on earth in which you can spend hundreds of dollars to enjoy a day fighting thousands of your best friends to get to the resort, to park, to buy your ticket, and to rent your skis. Like no place on earth in which you waste valuable money to battle crowd upon crowd in which you'll struggle to even get a table at lunch. It's like no place on earth where you get to combat person after person in the mob of people that overflowed out of the lift maze. The bit's getting old. I don't care. It's like no place on earth where even once you've spent significant dollars at the base getting all the essentials, you'll still be spending three figures for a meal. It's like no place on earth in which you'll get to listen to the wonderful soundtrack of idiots doing stupid things like cussing out people in the lift lines and getting hurt jumping off of cliffs for eight hours straight. Ah uh, yes, Veil. Vale. The experience of a lifetime, they say. Another thing about Veil. Vale. I really have to applaud your full-time residents. They're quite lovely, aren't they? Like, when you proposed building affordable housing for employees, the residents were all for it. So big props to your people too, Vale. Telluride. See, I've heard complaints from multiple people about how you close at the end of March or in early April, despite having good snow conditions. Now, I've heard a reason why you have to close right around then. I've heard that you have to close early due to agreements with the National Forest Service involving elk migratory patterns. But it sure would be nice if I and everyone else could have learned that without having to probe and ask multiple people before ever getting an answer. Surely every employee would know something as simple as that. But no, not in Telluride. If you look at the trail map, 
Telluride has this great three-stage gondola network that connects the resort with the town. The current operating agreement between the town and resort expires in 2027. After that, the future is debated. But one thing I do know is that for whatever reason, both the town and the resort are hesitant to build a new system. I get it'll cost millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, but then I turn around and look at Steamboat and Palisades Tahoe and their respective gondola projects, and I don't quite understand the hesitancy. I mean, you could even use it as a huge PR stunt if you wanted. But seriously, if you're going to maintain independence, you can't be scared of making big investments. This goes for the town, too. I'm not sure if y'all have noticed, but you kind of rely on the resort to support the local economy. So this gondola thing should be just as important of a PR stunt for the town itself as it is for the resort. I rest my case. Sunlight. In Volume 1, I was talking about your sketchy chairlift. Alas, I can no longer roast Segundo, as it's being replaced next summer. With that being on, I honestly don't have any roasts for you. Here, let me channel my inner 8-year-old and speedrun it. You're small, nobody's ever heard of you, your name is the most unoriginal thing ever, and you live in Aspen's shadow. Steamboat. I can't believe that you're actually going through with this whole wild blue gondola thing. Like, have you ever heard of the concept of trail capacity? If every resort thought they could get away with adding extra lifts with no regard, we might be able to find a second school marm among all of Keystone's counterparts. I do have to give you props that in all of this rearrangement of your base area, you managed to find an excuse to get rid of your fine waste of money you called a mountain coaster. You would think that since you hired an entirely separate firm to design this, they would be able to come up with a solution that doesn't involve re-engineering the mid-station of the six-pack, removing the triple, relocating the bottom of the six-pack, removing the coaster, and relocating the terrain park, all just to build one new lift. I mean, I know I don't work at whatever firm you hired, but have you ever just heard of crossing the freaking lifts? That way you don't have to hire out the entirety of the construction personnel of Route County for a summer. I'm just saying. Snowmass. You know, it's not often that one of the biggest ski areas in a given state is overshadowed by three of the smaller ski areas. But that's the case with Snowmass. In most cases, it would be suggested to stay at the bigger resort and plan to make day trips to the smaller ski areas, but not for Snowmass. For Snowmass, it's recommended that you stay in the town of Aspen and make a day trip to Snowmass. So what exactly does that say about you? Because to me, it sounds like you're not good enough to compete, so you just accept whatever leftovers you can get from Ajax, Highlands, and freaking buttermilk. Like, if I were to suggest that you stay at Homewood and take a day trip to Heavenly or Palisades, you might think I'm crazy. But it's just the Pitt King County magic, making everything work backwards. You're right, Snowmass. You are a destination like no other. A destination like no other simply in the fact that literally everything is opposite the way it should be. Silverton. See, there's definitely something to be said about skiing the most difficult mountain in North America. But then you're in your guided group, and you get stuck with someone who has no business being anywhere near the level of Silverton. After you get a whole three runs in, you can head back to the town of Silverton, in which there's absolutely zero appraiski or nightlife. Have fun. Purgatory. Last I checked, the definition of the word purgatory was a place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are expiating their sins before going to heaven. I mean, I get that not everyone is Catholic, but you really ought to consider what sort of connotations your name could have for all audiences. Now, I don't know about my audience, but I certainly am not trying to go skiing at a place of suffering. I mean, maybe if we're saying that you get to spend time before you get to move on to some other resort like Telluride, but seriously, why would you name a ski area Purgatory? Powderhorn. You might actually be a nice small to medium sized ski hill, but nobody would ever know since you're located in the middle of nowhere. The closest medium city to you is Grand Junction, and it's an hour-long drive for those residents. They'd be just as well off to drive two hours to Aspen instead. And for anyone wishing to visit, you'd sooner get a flight into Eagle County Airport than Grand Junction. Here's the problem. You're not a destination resort. If you were a destination resort like Vail or Aspen, people would have no problem flying into Eagle and driving two hours, or flying into Denver and driving four and a half hours. Unfortunately, you just don't have that kind of draw. I hope the best for you, I really do, but for the purpose of Hater's Guide, you're just a small ski hill in the middle of nowhere, of which I have zero comprehension into how you're staying financially afloat. Monarch. 
See, if you were a Midwest ski area, I would expect this of you, but I certainly wouldn't expect to see such a stark lack of difficult terrain at a medium-sized Rocky Mountain ski area. I mean, seriously, your Mirkwood Basin Zone is probably about the equivalent difficulty of skiing the trees in the High Lonesome Pot at Winter Park. If you know, you know. Loveland. The area of chairs 4, 8, and 9 at Loveland is a landscape that is known as tundra. Unfortunately, said tundra is so windswept that there's hardly any snow. Now, with the warming climate, I understand when ski areas are lacking snow outside of the runs. The only difference at Loveland is that even with no snow, the terrain is still open. It's just highly recommended to ski where there's snow and go around anything that looks like a plant or a rock. Part of Loveland's claim to fame is their chair 9, except here's the thing. If I want to go ski some good extreme terrain at extremely high altitude, I'll go to Breckenridge and ski Imperial. Chair 9 is just a slower and windier version of Imperial, and much of Chair 9's terrain requires way more hiking than Imperial's terrain. And oh yeah, don't forget that for as high of an elevation as Chair 9 goes, Imperial will always go higher. Lees. See, now, I can no longer condone hating upon small community ski hills. And plus, there's really not much material except that they're small. For many in those communities, the ski hill is a part of their local culture, economy, and livelihood. If you ever travel by one of these cities with a small hill, namely Lake City, Steamboat, Gunnison, Durango, and Uray, go spend a day on the hill with the locals. I promise it'll be one of the best snow sports experiences you ever have. Lake City. Keystone. There are two types of people who ski at Keystone, dumb and dumber. Those who are there with family are dumb. Those who are there for the bulls and extremes are dumber. If you're in the dumb category, leave all your personal space concerns at home. If you don't have a close encounter with a snowboarder going way too fast down a green at least once or twice, it's not the true Keystone experience. If you're in the dumber category, I put you there because Arapahoe Basin and Breckenridge, each a couple extra minutes down the road, have way better extreme terrain. And plus, the Bergman Bowl is getting a lift this year, which is going to further ruin the bulls at Keystone by putting a bunch of people there who really don't belong. Isn't it so unfortunate how year after year, resorts like Keystone fall victim to the pressure of adding more intermediate groomers instead of maintaining a secluded powder cache? At least these new runs won't all funnel into one awful run like they do on the front side with School Marm. Oh, wait. Kendall. Howelson. Hesperus. A majority of you are going to learn something new right now. Australia has skiing, and if you really want to, you can get a taste of Australian skiing here in our very own colorful Colorado. Hesperus is like Australia in that it has no snow, no trees, nothing really. It's a rather unique experience. Whether that uniqueness is good or bad lies in the eye of the beholder. Granby Ranch. Last time we did this, I was talking about the incident that occurred back in 2016. Luckily, you finally got it all sorted out yesterday, only a mere six years after the accident actually occurred. In those six years, a lot has changed about the area. One of those things is that you're now way overpriced, even when compared to your Vail Resorts counterparts. Explain how Granby Ranch, with barely 400 acres of terrain, can charge darn near the exact same price for an adult day ticket as Vail Mountain, which has over 5,000 acres. But you know what? I understand exactly where all of that extra money went. The first fatal chairlift incident in Colorado since 1985. And those of us just looking to spend a nice day at a smaller, less busy hill get to pay for your screw-up. Thanks a lot, Granby. Eldora. You know, there are some really crazy and ambitious master plans out there. But I really hope whoever in 2011 came up with this disaster of a master plan was sacked immediately. I'm pretty sure my 6th grade sister could come up with a solution for your problems that doesn't involve wasting $20 million on unnecessary lifts. Just for starters, who in their right mind thinks that Moose Glade needs its own dedicated detachable? If you're going to replace Corona, just make Corona and Moose Glade one longer lift. And explain to me the point of this 4 o'clock lift. I get if you wanted to add it for redundancy, but if you build the Jelly Jug lift first, as you should, 4 o'clock is just more millions of dollars down the drain. I swear, Eldora, you might just be more ambitious than Chris Paul thinking about winning a ring. Echo Mountain. This TripAdvisor page tells me everything I need to know. The first thing I'll highlight is the fact that you're ranked number 4 out of 16 things to do in Idaho Springs. 
Ranked ahead of you are two mines and a freaking glacier. The second thing I'll highlight is that you're the closest ski area to Denver, but nobody would ever know that, now would they? And even if people did know that you're the closest ski area to Denver, they would rather waste time and money to go to Breckenridge. Explain that to me. And then the final thing I'll point out is that the page gives the suggested time spent at Echo Mountain as two to three hours. That is a far cry from your 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. hours. The internet can literally tell how small of a ski area you are. But hey, if you're successful in your niche, you just keep doing your thing. Crested Butte. See, now, Crested Butte, I really could just go with the cliche and talk about how you were a nice hill and all until Vail came along, but that wouldn't be very original, now would it? In fact, there's probably a reason you sold to Vail. You probably had to sell just to stay afloat. Here's the one thing that has irked me since Vail bought you, though. This trail map from 2015 shows this lift here named Twister but you removed Twister a few years ago without replacement. Here's the current trail map. All of these great blacks up here are no longer lappable without a rundown international and an unnecessarily long lift ride back up the queen. Maybe that shiny new triple chair would have been better used to attract dedicated advanced skiers to come to Crested Butte by replacing Twister. Rather, you built it to replace the beginner hill that nobody even uses. Seriously, nobody uses Peachtree. Everybody just goes up to Painter Boy. Heck, maybe instead of replacing Teo Cali, you should have replaced Painter Boy. There, I just solved some of your problems. Unfortunately, I can't change the past. If any of you watching do have the power to change the past, hit me up. But unfortunately, I believe that we will just have to hope that Vail will make better decisions in the future. Even more unfortunately, I believe that it is inevitable that Vail will make poor decisions. But I mean, hey, it provides me material for these videos. Craner Hill Copper Mountain. You know, Copper, there's certainly a place in the ski market to cater to terrain park goers. There's also a place for catering to race training. And for the most part, I don't mind how much you center around the parks and race venues. Copper is such a big mountain that when it's just Copperopolis closed for racing, it really doesn't affect anyone. But as is with all things in life, there are exceptions. Copper, there's the thing called a choke point. Now, I know you can't really just up and move a super pipe, but that dang halfpipe creates one heck of a choke point near the bottom of American Eagle. That, along with when collage is closed for race training, can be quite annoying. Something else that sticks out about copper is the grooming. I just simply don't understand why one would want to groom runs such as Triple Treat, Rattler, and freaking Summit Stash, but not Eyedropper, Upper Sluice, and Liberty. I swear, every single ski area does something or has something that just makes you question what the higher-ups are thinking. Ski Cooper. It seems like the only two things keeping you running are Boy Scout troops and all of the residents of Lake County. I mean, seriously, it's not every day that you drive up a mountain pass and see that the Nordic Center is busier than the downhill ski area. I think that everyone has just gotten bored of skiing down a run that isn't challenging at all in two minutes flat, and then having to sit on the chair for over ten minutes to do it all again. But it seems like the community is keeping you alive for now, Cooper. One final thing. Who in their right mind calls the entrance and ticket office the port of entry and the will call? It sounds like I'm either getting off a plane in a different country, or I'm picking up my tickets at an amusement park. I really don't understand this on the map. Like I wouldn't be able to figure out how to get from my car to the chairlift or the ticket office without looking at the port of entry and will call route on the freaking trail map that I don't even have because you pick up trail maps at the ticketing office. Chapman Hill Buttermilk. Aspen Skiing Company has tried to push beginners to ski at their other two mountains rather than at Aspen Mountain and Aspen Highlands. You know what that results in? One mass wreck at the bottom of Buttermilk. In fact, it's not even just at the bottom of Buttermilk, it's throughout the whole of Buttermilk. What I really don't understand is how Buttermilk is supposed to be a beginner area when the most utilized green isn't even a run, it's a road. In fact, I consider the fact to be that there are only three true green runs in the entire area, and one of them is typically turned into a terrain park. Explain how you're going to funnel all of the beginner skiers in Aspen to a mountain that barely even has any beginner terrain. In case you haven't noticed, it's much more beneficial to have beginners spread out along nice wide run, like is the case at literally any other ski area. But at Buttermilk, the beginners get to share a narrow little road with a hundred of their best friends at a given time. I just don't get how that's conducive to learning to ski. 
Isn't the whole idea to encourage the beginners to continue to learn to ski and continue to return to your ski resorts, SkiCo? Because if one of my first experiences was trying to survive going down a long road with a mass of other people, I would have second thoughts about returning. Breckenridge See, Vale has definitely recognized what a mess Breckenridge is, especially as far as the lift system. They're trying their hardest to improve. At least, that's how it would seem. Three years and three new high-speed quads. That's how most people read it. Here's what I read. The layout of the base of Breckenridge's P8 is such a disaster that we're just going to throw in a bunch more lift capacity and hope people can figure out their way around. How about instead of putting a useless high-speed quad at chair 5, you replace C chair or 6 chair? Never mind the fact that they each serve a tr crucial terrain pod, especially 6 chair, but there's such long rides that it seems like I need to get warmed up again once I get to the top. And don't even get me started on the gondola situation. See, most ski areas have long lines at the beginning of the day from everyone arriving at once and trying to get on the mountain. This is the case for the Brecon Neck Gondola. But you know what's a big difference about this gondola? Say I was at Midvale at 345. I would probably choose to ski down, but if I wanted to ride the gondola, I would just walk over and get on. No big deal. At Breckenridge, if I wanted to ride the gondola down, I would have to wait in the exact same line I waited in in the morning. At Breckenridge, you have to wait in insane lines not only to get on the mountain and once you're on the mountain, but you also have to wait in insane lines to get off the mountain. Beaver Creek I'll be the first to admit, the bit about the bridge in Volume 1 wasn't that good. But the second part, about Aerobahn, still stands. I'm genuinely confused as to why the McCoy Park expansion was built instead of replacing Aerobahn. And for that matter, Bachelor Gulch and Cinch could have each used an upgrade as well. I understand catering to beginners and all that jazz, but you already had the Red Buffalo Pod along with the beginner area at the base. You remember how a few minutes ago I was complaining about how Buttermilk has too little beginner terrain for being a beginner mountain? Well, Beaver Creek, you have too much beginner terrain, even for being a beginner mountain. Of all ski areas in Colorado, there are very few I could say this about, but I actually think you need more intermediate terrain. Redtail gets so busy and icy, I could mistake it for I-70 on a Saturday morning powder day. There are very few ski areas in the state that lack a good blue groomer pod, but Beaver Creek is one among the few, which then brings me full circle back to Aerobahn. Aerobahn has a few nice blue groomers, but it really needs an upgrade. It literally has half the capacity of a normal high-speed quad. Half! It's great to attract beginners, but you need to keep them once they move on to the blues. Aspen Highlands. In Volume 1, I complained about your lack of lift serving the terrain below Cloud 9. Now, I get that that was less than one year ago, so I was going to let it slide and talk about something else. But it's still my biggest complaint about Highlands by far, so I did some research on it. Here is the trail map from 1998. You see this lift here? Exhibition 2. Remove the summer of 1999. Why would you remove the lift? I just don't understand it. Going back to the present, you don't even need to build a new chairlift here. Build a T-bar or buy an old lift and relocate it. I guarantee that with the record rates of new lifts being built, there's some old lift somewhere that could have a second life as Exhibition 2 at Highlands. Here's another point that I've heard up brought up a couple of times. What happens if Exhibition goes down? It happens. Ski lifts break, just like every other machine. Right now, if Exhibition goes down, the entire mountain closes. There's no way to get on the mountain. But if you rebuild Exhibition 2, even when Exhibition goes down, you can still access the mountain via Thunderbolt. This just seems like common sense at this point. And I don't want to hear any excuses about money. I guarantee you that Aspen Skiing Company, the same company pulling money out of nowhere to build an expansion at Ajax, can afford one or two million dollars to buy a platter, T-bar, or relocated chairlift for Highlands. Arapaho Basin. Only one year, and I don't even have the material from last year. This is why Arapaho Basin is one of the best ski areas I've ever visited. I'm excited to ride the new Lenaway Express. You know what I'm not excited to experience? All the beginners that shouldn't be at the top of the mountain accidentally finding their way up there because of the new Lenaway. That's the problem at A.D. Basin. It's not even the ski area itself. The problem is the people. Because Arapaho Basin is a relatively advanced mountain, I find myself sitting at the bottom of the Zoomer Bowl or the Beavers watching some idiot who thought they were invincible get their stretcher put on the chairlift. Just a quick PSA, if you've never skied a black before, Arapaho Basin 
is not the place to try it, especially not in the Beavers. Ajax. For all of you who aren't locals, this is Aspen Mountain. Now, Ajax has two major projects in the works. The first is Pandora, and the second is 1A. In short, Pandora is an expansion that's going to include a high-speed quad. This expansion terrain is located at the top of the mountain. The 1A project proposes a hybrid chairlift gondola, known as a Telemix, to replace the current Shadow Mountain lift and reopen that side of the mountain as a portal to alleviate a lot of the pressure off the gondola. I love both of these projects for the development of the future of Aspen Mountain. What I don't like is the fact that the geniuses who planned these out have decided to build Pandoras first. How about instead of waiting in half hour lines for the gondola, you solve that problem by building 1A, and then you build your terrain expansion. The problem here is not the terrain and lift capacity at the top of the mountain, Aspen. The problem here is the lift capacity at the base. But I guess you'd rather attract even more Icon Pass holders to clog up the gondola lines rather than alleviate the lines in the first place. Well, I think that about does it for Volume 2 of Hater's Guide. We have now successfully proven that I suck at coming up with jokes. In all seriousness, if you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much for sticking it out. If you made it this far, you might as well like and subscribe. While you're at it, go ahead and let me know of any other atrocities I missed down below. Once again, thank you so much for watching. All my love, I'm out.